The Full Melt Show is intended for a mature audience. It contains adult themes, adult content, and sometimes adult language. Listener discretion is advised. Full Melt. The Full Melt Show. A marijuana discussion about news, culture, politics, and lifestyle. Fullmelt.com. Toll free. 844-420-TALK. 844-420-TALK. Hey, uh, welcome to another full week of the Full Melt Show. Uh, this time, I promise, it's flu-free. Yeah, we. All right, so I've always said since uh, the beginning of this program, uh, some five years ago, uh, that uh, this will become more and more mainstream, this subject. And uh, look, this is not a prediction that it takes a psychic to make. Anytime you mix the subjects of prohibition of anything, especially something like cannabis and the long history that cannabis has, and you start propelling that forward in uh, the popular culture, media is going to pick up on it. And it's going to become more and more popular. It's just kind of a foregone conclusion. It doesn't really take any special uh, tea, uh, tea leaf reader to, to figure this stuff out. Um, honestly, uh, since that prediction was made some five years ago, I can tell you that it has gotten much more prolific uh, for me to find content on the regular television, uh, regular mainstream popular media about cannabis, about hemp, about uh, medical marijuana, about its availability and access uh, to responsible adults um, without the fear of reprisal or, or, you know, home invasion or being sent off to jail. It's not always been this way. And in some cases, it still is. And in fact, many cases, it still is. Uh, This program that you uh, heard at the beginning of this uh, show is a new series on CNN Starting uh, this weekend on Sunday, it premieres at 10 o'clock Eastern time on Sunday. The series is called High Profits, and the idea behind it is rather unique. Now, you've seen American weed and you've seen weed wars, and there's been other intonations of this subject on different cable channels throughout time. Uh, They've always been rather short lived, but they've always focused on just kind of the fascination around marijuana culture. Um. This program is a little bit different in the respect that it focuses on the profitability of retail cannabis to adults in Colorado and the methodology with, by which people are, are, are seeking that profit out. A lot of people are concentrated, are focused in the city of Denver, uh, where this has been kind of a wide open door, uh, sometimes with dragging feet. But nonetheless, Denver has been the most open to this issue. And in many of the little small town, the little resorts, Colorado is made up of a lot of little resort towns, a ton of them. I could list uh, 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 on both hands uh, small towns really quickly, and uh, you would see that they're all little, little populous areas that have huge influxes of tourists, especially during the ski season. A lot of snowboarders, a lot of skiers, a lot of people who enjoy uh, the winter sports. And the program focuses this high profit series starting again Sunday at 10 o'clock Eastern on CNN. We're talking CNN here. Uh, the, the same place that uh, Sanjay Gupta did weed and weed two. Also on Sunday, uh, weed three uh, going to be uh, on the air. I believe it immediately precedes this program. Uh, but our guests this hour are uh, the featured players in the series, uh, Brian and Caitlin uh, from High Profits. Uh, welcome to the program. Can you hear me at all? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you for having us. Uh, look, I'm really glad to have you on. Um, I kind of set the stage for you. Uh, tell us about the program and maybe how you got involved in it. How did you, uh, you know, come into contact with the people at, at the production company that decided to seek this series out and, and start producing it? Uh, I mean, really, the uh, the production company, Backbridge, who put this together, uh, found us. So we were lucky in the sense that they, they approached us and asked us if we would be interested in, in doing this series. And uh, for pretty much all of those reasons that you just mentioned, we were ecstatic to be able to jump at this opportunity and, and uh, bring this topic even more into the mainstream than it already is, which has, has uh, really just been exponential over the last few years, over the last five years. And we were excited 
to uh, bring awareness to to this industry and how the inner workings really of this industry and how it's working out in Colorado uh, as far as a legal industry is concerned and, and show that to the rest of the country. Now, uh, you guys uh, have a little bit of a different take on maybe how to extract profit from Colorado uh, with marijuana. Um then, then I think the rest of the uh, the pack is gone. Many people uh, have focused on going to the place that's been the most open in Denver. Uh, you guys chose to lean away from Denver. Can you tell us why? Well, Denver seemed like a, an overly saturated marketplace to begin with, and with what you know, what we hoped would be limited competition in the resort town, um, we decided to go up there where everything tends to cost a little bit more. You know, rents a little higher. A gallon of milk costs more, a gallon of gasoline costs more. And, and that means that, you know, there's a larger number that if you're getting the same percentage of, of that number as profit as you would in a town like Denver, uh, that you're getting a larger dollar amount as profit. I think in the promo you said, um, I can get five times the amount out of somebody in Breckenridge uh, on one sale than I can get from somebody in Denver. Is that, is that playing out mostly true? You know, that really hasn't played out quite that way. Um, that was more true in the first month or two of legalization, which is when those cameras were rolling. Um, and that was because in the first month or two, Colorado saw a huge supply shortage um, of cannabis, and so prices just skyrocketed. And our business mechanism was in place to, um, to be prepared to deliver cannabis to the masses But we had to restrict sales to single-gram purchases rather than what you might see people buying two, four, seven, or, you know, uh, 28 grams at a time and getting uh, an economies of scale discount, a bulk discount. Um, We were not able to offer that or we would have sold out of marijuana and there would have been none left for any of the customers on month two or three. Wow. So we had to limit it to grams only. And the uh, the gram price to keep people from buying multiple grams was just so high that it ended up being you know much uh, higher profit than you saw uh, in, in certainly in the black market in the rest of the nation. So in the first few days, it might have even been higher than five times the amount you could have gotten in Denver. Is that true? <clears throat> in the first few days, Denver actually had a very similar issue that we did. There was only about twenty stores in the entire nation open on the first two days, and they were all in Colorado, and it was still only 20 stores, less than two dozen. And so everyone had that problem for the first few days, but Denver was certainly the, the uh, place with the largest gardens and the largest um, production of cannabis. So it was, uh, they were the first ones to bring their prices back down because they had access to supply. Once supply reached the mountains, um, we came down quite a bit as well, though it's still a little bit more expensive than you're going to find in Denver. Uh, the tourism there in Denver is about how many people a year? Do you know? Oh, in Denver, I'm not 100 percent sure. How about in uh, Breckenridge? I'm sure you know Breckenridge. Yeah, we get about 1.5 uh, million visitors per season in Breckenridge. And the the population there is about how big? About 4,000 people. Wow, <laughs> that's a huge, huge difference in numbers of people. The people that live there and the people that come to visit. Yeah, that makes our um, customer count at about uh, 75% tourism and 25% local base. And, and for local base, that we include all Colorado residents for that. So a lot of the times in the mountains when you hear about maybe local discounts or local residents, they're talking about their specific town. But uh, we consider local, you know, anyone that has a Colorado ID. And like Brian was saying, around... 25% or less of our customers are from Colorado, and, and most of them come from outside of the state from somewhere. And uh, they only need uh, whatever ID their local government provides them to, to, to come into uh, your establishment? Correct, yes. As long as it's valid uh, and it's a government-issued ID, then, then it'll work at our store. Wow. Um, Listen, we're going to be coming up on a break here shortly, so don't be surprised by music in the background. That's just telling us that we're uh, coming up on the break. Um, when we go to break on the other side, I'd like to come back and kind of examine uh, the difference between, you know, Denver politics and small town America politics. Maybe more of the style that you guys uh, have had to deal with there uh, in Breckenridge. You got it. Um, 
while while the transition was being made between uh, recreational and medical, um, there had to have been uh, quite some a bit of a. Uh, action going on there locally it seemed like there was some turmoil i did get a chance to see the premiere uh in advance uh in in kind of you know getting ready for this program so when we come back on the other side i'd like to talk about the local city council the local politics of cannabis and how you guys got it done there most interested in that subject it's the full melt show you're getting the full melt each week Pot Pitch takes a look at different medical or legal pot business as they attempt to seek investment capital and partners in order to take their business to the next level. What do investors like? And which entrepreneurs are shown the door? Real venture capitalists, smart entrepreneurs, and exciting business models in a brand new industry. Cannabis. Pot Pitch. Find out what this new marijuana industry will look like and who its players will be. Real deals. Real people. Real decisions. Pot Pitch at potpitch.com and featured on the Full Melt Radio Show. Got something to hide? Canalock offers discreet and effective storage solutions that destroy odor, so nobody knows. Canalock is a patented charcoal activated bag that discreetly stores your marijuana. Canalock is made from the same material as military chemical warfare suits. Get yours at Canalock.com. Visit Canalock.com to learn more about no-smell technology. Imagine a world where patients can use marijuana like any other medicine. The Marijuana Patients Organization challenges the status quo by helping our neighbors to enjoy a better quality of life. Visit the MPO at MarijuanaPatients.org and enjoy informative articles, engaging debates, and information about treatments, doctors, and dispensaries in your area. Over 50,000 people have registered at MarijuanaPatients.org since 2010. Join us at the Marijuana Patients Organization today, MarijuanaPatients.org. It started with Weed 1. Some have called it a watershed moment. Then came Weed 2. It's absurd that we would have to do this to get medicine. Now Dr. Sanjay Gupta is at it again, and he's reaching higher than ever with Weed 3. I never thought I would be smoking weed in the hospital. The movement behind it. We demand this plant go through the process of the FDA. The radical research. I have to say I'm kind of stunned. Weed 3, the marijuana revolution. They're parasites. They've got no contribution to this society. They're preying on our community and our kids. It's going to end bad. He's got exactly $100,000 in cash in the back of his car. I bet there's guys right there in that prison for doing just what we're about to do the Breckenridge Cannabis Club to be a household name. This is us pioneering a new industry. He's going after every resort town in Colorado. His plan is brilliant. This is a big boy operation now. We are not the Amsterdam of the Rockies. We're Breckenridge. Absolutely unbelievable to us that this has happened so quickly. That's when the town erupted. All hell can break loose. I think we have an image to protect. The powerful Mm -hmm. elite has definitely put the pressure on. Everyone is playing everyone. They're going to have a target painted on their back. That is a real threat. There's $2 billion to be had next year. I plan to take more than my fair share. High Profits, Sunday night at 10 Eastern on CNN. It's the Full Melt Radio Show. Radio Show. All right, now for about 100 years, uh, the words marijuana and controversy have been nearly synonymous. Uh, So for those of you seeking change, the real trouble has been determining fact from fantasy, truth from fallacy, uh, reality from fiction. To help us do that in an objective, credible way has been Dr. Sanjay Gupta, who we welcome to the program tonight. Good evening, Dr. Gupta. Good evening, Steve. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, I'm so glad that you had an opportunity to come on the program. Uh, I, I'm, I've been fascinated with your coverage of this information uh, since you made your turnabout. Um, I've always wanted to ask you, uh, when you made that turnabout, how were you received by other colleagues in your field? Mm. Yeah, no, it's a, um, it's a good question. You know, it, it's funny. I, I think that the, the medical community um, 
has actually been, uh, even if they haven't been outwardly supportive of this issue, uh, I think a lot of people within the medical community have recognized the the, uh, merits of being able to study this scientifically and and the promise that it has shown in some areas. You know, there was a uh, paper a few years ago in the New England Journal of Medicine where they basically uh, created a a patient's story and asked, uh, uh, polled doctors uh, what percentage would, would consider using medicinal marijuana in this case, and I think it was close to 80% of doctors say they would consider it. So I think um, there, there is an openness about it. I think even within my small section of medicine and neurosurgery um, this month, in the month of April, um, marijuana uh, and uh, it's some of the science around it is on the cover of the journal. So it's, uh, it's been received well, and I think it's, in, it's fostered a lot of discussion. Uh, what made you dig into this subject on your own, independently, uh, what was the cause? What was the impetus behind that? Was it Charlotte's <laughs> Web? Was it was it Josh Stanley and uh, the Charlotte's Web strain uh, and seizures? It, well, there was a there was almost a drip, drip, drip sort of. Um, way that this happened you know i in, in the past as you may know steve i before i you know had the 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 turnaround i did not think the the evidence was particularly compelling when it came to, to medical marijuana it just i looked at the u.s evidence and uh it you know most of the studies i saw over 90 percent of them were talking about harm uh, of medical marijuana uh, a very small percentage to look at benefit and i realized that that was sort of the system as opposed to the facts meaning that the studies were designed to look for harm in the first place. The studies that were getting funded in the United States were designed to look for harm. We're, like, we're talking so, about the National Institute of Health. We're talking about the government agencies which fund and approve marijuana research in this country, which include uh, the FDA, the DEA, and the National Institute on Drug Abuse, NIDA. Right. They all have to approve uh, a federally approved research for, for marijuana, and, and so much of the research was 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 not looking at benefit. I mean, look, National Institute on Drug Abuse is one of the agencies that has to approve it. Their mandate is to study drug abuse, not drug benefit. So that was one thing. And so when I started to look at other labs, I would hear from other researchers who say you need to look at these studies and, and look at studies that were coming from places outside the United States and look at studies from labs that were not federally funded. And when I really started to dig into it, it started to paint a different picture. And that started the investigation, I think, that there was more to the story than what you might find just looking at the United States scientific literature. And that took me to to meeting people like the Figgy family and and obviously Sweet Charlotte and the Stanley brothers who had created Charlotte's Web, but also lots of other researchers and, 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 uh, you know, traveling to Israel and spending time with Roth Meshulam. These were all parts of that journey. When you did Weed One, I really did not expect, because it wasn't Weed One, it was just weed. I wasn't expecting a two or a three. Um, What made you go into two and now three? Because I really didn't expect three to come out, which is uh, premiering uh, this Sunday night at nine on CNN. Am I correct? That's correct. Yep, nine Eastern on Sunday. You know, I I think as we work on these um, documentaries, there's so much to them uh, that uh, almost even before you're done with one, you realize that there's enough for a second documentary or that you've only been able to tell a small part of the story. If the first documentary sort of looked at what had happened in the past, the second looked at the current state of affairs at the time, and the third one is sort of looking to the future. What's what's this medicinal marijuana revolution going to feel like, look like? What is happening here? And, And look, already we, we, we start thinking about what beyond that because we're, we, we've gotten some amazing access to some of the earliest trials now, randomized trials, uh, really pristine scientific method in terms of studying this. People are going to see these trials underway. Uh, and they're going to want to know the results as well. We share some of the early results, but how does this all pan out over time I think is going to be something that we might even explore later. So, you know, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm kind of like you, Steve. I didn't know when we did the first one that there'd be a two or there'd be a three either, but there's just so much around this issue, around medicine in general, around marijuana in particular, around our drug policies as a whole. Just in a more broadly relevant point, Steve, is that it's not just marijuana. It's a lot of things in our society. When you look at the data that is presented to you, even scientific data, it is always worth asking a few more questions. 
uh, who funded the data, where did it come from, what was the hypothesis these researchers were starting with? Were they, were they trying to find benefit? Were they trying to find harm? Uh, what other papers have they published? Here's another one. Uh, with the marijuana literature, almost all of the patients who are in the studies are patients who have already failed every existing therapy. They are a particularly difficult group of patients to treat in the first place. So it's not as if these are people who are getting their first treatments for whatever malady they may have. And so they, they already you're going to have a, a more difficult population of patients to treat. You can't treat that data the same as you would treat other data. I may be, may be telling you more than you want to know, but I'm saying that it takes time to really interpret these studies and put them in the context that I think is, uh, is, is so necessary before you report it. Well, what's the most surprising thing you found in uh, the work that you've done leading up to these three documentary studies? Well, I mean, you know, one of the surprising things that came to, came to me after the first one aired was that, um, you know, it was a little nerve-wracking to put this on the air, and it's a little nerve-wracking to say something that, um, you know, is, is different, first of all, than what I had said in the past and different than what a lot of people are saying currently. So that, that was just a nerve-wracking experience. But what surprised me afterward, I think, was how many people, both uh, within the medical community, uh, within the legal community, within law enforcement, but also, you know, our, our kids, friends, parents, grandparents that would come up to me and talk about this issue. And here it is, this thing that people are, are fearful to talk about because it is so heavily stigmatized. And all of a sudden, you know, this was a topic that a lot of people had thought about, especially because maybe they had a loved one who had suffered and they wondered if, if, if something like this could have helped them. And, and they, they want to talk about it. I think there's a much broader um, openness to this than, than people realize. We, we know that the majority of the country is now in favor of, of marijuana. We know three-quarters of the country favors it for medicinal purposes. But I think, you know, I think the, the support runs much deeper than, than, than you would initially think looking at, uh, looking at America as a whole. The words human endocannabinoid system, is that something that's prevalent in the medical community? Because it seems to be in the medical marijuana community. They're becoming very familiar with uh, this new discovery. It wasn't something that I learned in medical school. And uh, what, what you're talking about is this, this, this um, a system of, of receptors in our body uh, that allow cannabinoids to bind to them. We have circulating endocannabinoids in our body. Uh, one of them is called anandamide. And that is a, it is a uh, marijuana-like substance which circulates in our body. And, um, it's produced, and it by, the, it's produced it's by our body? Produced by our body. It's, it's, it's endogenous, meaning we produce it, it binds to the receptors, it does it all on its own. And uh, we know that um, there are some people who may have low levels of those endocannabinoids. They may have high levels of receptors, so not enough cannabinoid to actually uh, stimulate all those receptors. It could be all sorts of different things. We know certain disease states, uh, even the speculation is with post-traumatic stress, you have too many of these receptors and not enough of the substance in your body. Uh, and so when you give a, a substance that binds to those receptors, you can help restore the brain to a more natural state. That is a hypothesis, but that, that they don't know for sure yet. That's what they're trying to study. But that is an idea of the mechanisms by which this can work. We evolved as human beings with cannabinoids. So the idea that we have cannabinoid receptors in our body is not that surprising. I think what is, what is surprising for a lot of people is that there's a whole system, an endocannabinoid system in our bodies. And uh, it controls and regulates a number of various different functions. Isn't that correct? We have these receptors in our brain, but we also have them in our gut, for example. And the idea there is that um, uh, if you have um, cannabinoids that can bind to these receptors, uh, the, the thought is that it may be exerting an anti-inflammatory effect. So people, for example, who have um, inflammatory bowel disease, who, who use extracts of, of uh, marijuana, sometimes get tremendous relief. It doesn't, by the way, relieve everyone's symptoms. No medicine does. But it does seem to offer benefit in a lot of these patients who have not received benefit anywhere else. So uh, if you have inflammatory bowel disease and you're able to give a substance which stimulates the anti-inflammatory receptors in your gut, could that have a benefit? Uh, the answer seems to be yes. But this, again, Steve, it's exactly what some of these studies are going to be all about. It needs to be studied. Are a lot of these studies actually happening? Have they been approved by the federal government yet? Are they underway? Yeah, you know, that's, I think... 
that that was to me as a scientist was probably the most uh, interesting thing and I think exciting. You know, I, I say that there's a revolution going on because there are a lot of studies now getting approved. There had only been 16 studies that had, uh, you know, been been approved and received marijuana from NIDA uh, for for many years, and um, now you now you're having uh, that many over the last year alone. So it's really starting to to change, and I think also the you know academic scientists who previously just because of it was such a stigmatized world they weren't even going to dip a toe into that world and now they're diving in head first so you know you're getting a different levels of researchers you're getting different levels of support you're getting you know bipartisan legislation on the floor of the senate you're getting the president of the united states talking about it uh, it's it's you feel like something is happening there's real movement and momentum with regard to marijuana is, is there going to be a day, a time when you walk into a pharmacy and there will be different forms of this as a patented medication uh, produced by a pharmaceutical company? I think that, that, that day could very well come. There's already a pharmaceutical company, GW Pharmaceutical, which is now trialing uh, medications uh, that are cannabis-based medications in the United States for the things like epilepsy. I think that could very well happen. I, I think one of the things that I think is going to need to be resolved is that when it comes to marijuana, um, one, of the, one of the pioneers of marijuana research, uh, a guy named Roth Meshulam out of Israel, really um, uh, speaks about something known as the entourage effect. And what that basically means is that while there are some very active components in this plant, there are other smaller components which probably all play a role in terms of exerting medicinal benefit. They work together. So the idea of just taking out a single compound and turning it into a drug may not be as effective as being able to use the whole plant. How that gets translated into medicines, I think we're going to have to wait and see, but I think it's something to keep an eye on. A lot of people did not know about the upcoming Weed 3. Uh, they're excited to hear about it. Some of them may be hearing about it as we're speaking about it. I think um, they're going to, uh, first of all, they're going to understand a lot of uh, why medical marijuana, what it does in the body, and just the, 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 the true learning about this substance and what happens. But I think, you know, besides hearing from the, the, the senators who have now proposed the most audacious legislation, besides hearing from the president, you're also going to meet the people who, who are really uh, have been at the forefront of this, the scientists who have been studying it, get to know them, what has motivated them, kept them going after decades of basically being told no. And I think most importantly, the patients. You know, uh, an investment banker named Sean Kernan, who's also a veteran, uh, came back from Panama uh, years ago and has suffered with post-traumatic stress for a long time. Uh, did everything he was supposed to do. Uh, took all the medications, the antidepressants, the anti-anxiety medications, the sleep medications, all the things that were prescribed to him by his doctors. And you know what happened is that he almost died from this. He eventually tried to commit suicide. He was that bad off. And he, he nearly died trying to get better. And then he, he turns to cannabis, never wanted to try it before, wasn't never on his radar. And suddenly, uh, you, you'll see him. I mean, I, I can tell you, as you might guess, that he is a completely changed man. Uh, wife, four kids. I mean, he, he, this is a successful, highly motivated guy who just wanted to get better. Amelia Taylor, who's a 34-year-old woman, a stay-at-home mom, she's got kids, um, also suffered from post-traumatic stress, not as a veteran, but from something else. And she is, uh, was a hermit. I mean, she, she couldn't function as a, as a mother, as a, as a wife. Uh, she couldn't do anything. Uh, you know, church, church-going, homeschooled gal who never thought about marijuana, and now she's tried it for the first time in October of 2014, and you're going to see the impact it's made on her life. You're going to meet people who have had pain, chronic pain, that's been untreatable with narcotics, with everything. Uh, it's a life of chronic pain. And there's so many people like that out there, Steve. And, and uh, here, here you're going to see uh, what impact um, cannabis had on this person and how she's been able to use it now in a hospital. It's, 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 it's going to give you a, a real look at what's happening with this marijuana revolution at this time in our history. And I think it's going to be really important for people to understand this. Fascinating, amazing stuff. Thank you for putting your credible stamp and your critical eye on this subject because it's so important to so many people. And I have to tell you, as an anecdote, I'm wearing my maize and blue cap as we're doing this interview. Our studio is about 20 minutes from your alma mater there in Ann Arbor at, Michigan, at University of Michigan. So. Uh, I feel like home. <laughs> go, go blue. And, you know, I guess they're calling it Ann Arbaugh here now. Up there. <laughs> they are indeed. Dr. Sanjay Gupta, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the program today. And uh, good luck with this Weed 3. It, it really is gangbusters. Thank you very much. I appreciate the time. All thank right. you. Bye-bye. Mm,
Bye-bye. You're getting the full melt. They're parasites. They've got no contribution to this society. They're preying on our community and our kids. And it's going to end badly. He's got exactly $100,000 in cash in the back of his car. I bet there's guys right there in that prison for doing just what we're about to do. I want the Breckenridge Cannabis Club to be a household name. This is us pioneering a new industry. He's going after every resort town in Colorado. His plan is brilliant. This is a big boy operation now. We are not the Amsterdam of the Rockies. We're Breckenridge. Absolutely unbelievable to us that this has happened so quickly. That's when the town erupted. All hell can break loose. I think we have an image to protect. The powerful Ooh. elite has definitely put the pressure on. Everyone is playing everyone. They're going to have a target painted on their back. That is a real threat. There's $2 billion to be had next year. I plan to take more than my fair share. High Profits, Sunday night at 10 Eastern on CNN. Got something to hide? Canalock offers discreet and effective storage solutions that destroy odor, so nobody knows. Canalock is a patented charcoal activated bag that discreetly stores your marijuana. Canalock is made from the same material as military chemical warfare suits. Get yours at canalock.com. Visit Canalock.com to learn more about no-smell technology. Does your dog or cat suffer with joint disorders, arthritis, anxiety, cancer, chronic pain, or other ailments? Hemp or cannabis-based medicinal products are now legal. Why should your pets go without the same options that we have available? Try Satibis, a daily hemp oil with CBD. Satibis is quality inspected and made in the USA. Easy to use drops are applied directly to your pet's food. For your pet's wellness, try Satibis Drops. Ask for Satibis at your local pet store or learn more at PetPain.com. You know, it's not easy out there, but it can be easier. And when it comes to medical marijuana in Michigan and chronic pain management, Dr. Bob Townsend, renowned for his patient advocacy and deep understanding of how patients and medical marijuana certifications fit together, makes it his hallmark to educate and provide the best holistic treatment for your condition. His knowledgeable staff makes you feel warm and welcome. And Dr. Bob makes you feel well. With locations across the state in Cadillac and Gaylord, Kalamazoo, Marquette, Mount Pleasant, Muskegon, Saginaw, Traverse City, you can't beat the convenience and feeling you get knowing you have someone on your side that cares. Denali Healthcare is on the web at DenaliHealthCareMI.com. Get answers to your holistic health questions or schedule an appointment now by calling 989-339-4464. Chronic pain management and holistic health answers is what they do. It's all they do. DenaliHealthCareMI.com. Get your certification and peace of mind now by making an appointment with Dr. Bob Townsend at 989-339-4464. With this warmer weather, I get more active. Headaches and pains keep me from doing things I enjoy, like golfing and working outside my yard. Toledo Hemp Center's new location, 1415 Sylvania Avenue, has shown me there is an alternative to pharmaceutical drugs. I use CBD, cannabidiol, infused hemp lotions, oral sprays, and topical oils. Thank you, Toledo Hemp Center, for helping me restore and maintain my health with no side effects and no high. Find out more at Toledo Hemp Center.com. For a limited time at Domino's, large two-topping pizzas are only $5.99 each when you carry out, which is why we brought in Dale. Dale Lamarou, Domino's fastest pizza box forward. Because when you have a $5.99 carryout deal this amazing, the last thing you want to do is run out of boxes. Because no box, no carryout. <laughs> This week only, carry out large two-topping pizzas for just $5.99 each, only at Domino's. It's the Full Melt Radio Show. Radio Show. Are you there? We are here. And you sound terrific. Uh, thanks Thank for thanks for coming on the program, Russ. I put our uh, other caller on hold while we while we're talking. We've got a little bit of a late start today. Oh yeah, so sorry about that. Uh, no, it's my fault, not yours. <laughs> uh, look, um, what's happening in Oregon and what's happening in Washington? It seems like medical marijuana rights are at risk. You're out of Oregon. Can you tell me what's going on there? Because it seems like a lot of people are up in arms. Yeah, I can tell you the Pacific Northwest right now, uh, in the wake of recreational marijuana legalization, is facing increased scrutiny 
in its medical marijuana programs. And let me start with Washington State because the, the situation is probably more dire there right. and more certain at this point. A bill has recently passed, and Governor Inslee has signed uh, this bill in Washington State that makes radical changes. Well, you know, it might not be fair to call it radical changes so much as institutes some regulations. The, the medical marijuana system in Washington has been fairly laissez-faire for ever since it began in 1998. It never specified that there would be medical marijuana dispensaries, but economics being what they are, medical marijuana dispensaries came into, an, into existence. Uh, at first, they used a loophole of the caregiver law, and then when that loophole was closed, they used a loophole of the collective law. And so now what has passed in Washington State is that these unregulated medical marijuana dispensaries, which have no inspection regulation or pay any sort of taxes, uh, are now facing uh, elimination. Uh, the governor signed this law that basically means that there will no longer be such a thing as a medical marijuana dispensary. There will only be I-502 marijuana shops. Those are the ones created by the regulations of recreational legalization. And some of those shops can have a medical certification. Uh, supposedly, this medical certification will mean that the employees in those shops, the bud tenders, will have some instruction, uh, education on how to talk about the medical utility of the plant, as well as possibly requiring these medically certified stores to have to carry more medicinal products, things like salves, tinctures, high CBD products in the sun. And also offer discounts, correct? A 25% discount, isn't that part of it? No, unfortunately, what's going on here, uh, the Washington State uh, recreational tax was ridiculous. It was 25% at the wholesale processing and retail levels, three different levels of 25% taxation. Wow. There are two different bills in the Washington legislature right now to reduce that to just one level of taxation. One bill is 30%, the other one 37%, <laughs> both way too high. And this new law would not exempt medical marijuana patients from having to pay that excise tax. They would get an exemption from paying sales taxes, which in Washington State can be, I think, 6.9%, I think. But effectively, since there's local taxes, it ends up being like 8 or 9% in most, most places. When, so they uh, would get that tax break, but not the 30 or 37% that's going to pass. When communities pass high tax rates for either medical marijuana or retail cannabis, don't they, in effect, cause a black market situation that they're trying to eliminate by passing this legality? Uh, to kind of flourish on its own in a place where they can avoid taxation at high rates? Yeah, that's, that's one of the, uh, the real dichotomies. One of the dissonances of legalizing marijuana is, is we sell it on tax revenues that we could make and eliminating the black market. Those two things are mutually exclusive. <laughs> if you're making a lot of tax revenue, that means you're charging a lot of tax. If you're charging a lot of tax, that means there's incentive for a black market to undercut that tax. Well, there's a black I, cigarette market. Uh, people get busted all the time taking uh, cigarettes from a reservation or a place where the taxes are extremely low and bringing them into a place like New York City where the taxes are really high. Or you end up like Eric Martin getting choked to death by the NYPD. Selling so Lucy's. Do cigarettes. Yes, right. exactly. <laughs> Any product that has regulation will have a black market. The key is to find that sweet spot where it's taxed low enough that the black market is negligible and, and you can cope with it, but taxed high enough to make a certain amount of revenues. And the problem with marijuana is under a totally legal uh, regime, marijuana would be as cheap to produce as tea. It wouldn't cost that much. You couldn't raise that much tax money off it. So, yeah, this is, this is a big problem. Other things happening in Washington State is Washington State was one of – was the only state – aside from California, that did not have a medical marijuana patient registry. Most states have a, a mandatory registry. You have to sign up. Some have a voluntary registry, like Colorado. California's is done on a county-by-county county basis as a voluntary registry. Washington State was the only one that had no registry. You could just get your letter from your doctor, and you were good to go. Well, now this new bill that's been signed creates a voluntary registry. You don't have to sign up. If you don't sign up, you get to possess one ounce of marijuana. You can buy one ounce of marijuana in the stores. You can grow four marijuana plants at home. If you sign up for the registry, you get triple the possession amounts. You can buy three ounces. You can possess three ounces. And you can uh, cultivate up to six plants at home. Problem is, patients up till now have had a limit of 24 ounces and 15 plants. So for them, it's, it's a real cut in what they've been allowed.
And also kind of a danger because uh, what happens if they get busted after the law changes and they've still got this uh, possession under the old law, now the new law takes effect, some people are at risk. Oh, absolutely. And a number of medical marijuana growers I've talked to, uh, these are people, by and large, you know, yes, there are some people that are going to take advantage of any system and game it for profit. Let's take those people aside and talk about the majority of the growers in the medical marijuana field who are really just compassionate people, home gardeners, maybe they were involved with, with marijuana back in the day, and nowadays they're growing marijuana to help sick people that they know personally. So if you are one of these growers donating your time and your talents to try to produce medicine for, let's say, 12 sick people, which of those 12 do you no longer serve when the law changes? When the law changes, you're going to turn to one of those people with cancer or AIDS and say, sorry, can't help you no more. No, these compassionate people are going to keep serving those people and just try to stay under the radar and not get busted for it. And unfortunately, some of them will. Is there anything people could do to fight back against this? Is there any going back? Well, in Washington State, uh, this Friday on my show, I'm actually interviewing some activists that are putting together a referendum on this to take it to the voters to say, look, we voted on medical marijuana in 98. That medical marijuana said that patients should be able to have a 60-day supply. And these new rules, these new laws, effectively are nullifying what the people voted for in 1998. They want to put together another vote to have people reaffirm what medical marijuana should be in the state. That's who you could get involved with. That's um, her, The lady's name is Sarah Frank, S-E-R-R-A, Sarah Frank, and uh, Billy Fisher. Uh, I'm sure you can find them on Facebook if you look. And uh, they, that might be the next, uh, the next place to be putting our efforts. It's kind of sad that you've got to go back uh, and do what you already did before. It's a very expensive, very draining, very time-consuming process to organize these efforts to get laws changed. Isn't uh, this a model where legislators in other states could say, look, if we do the a retail thing, too, we could wipe out the medical marijuana thing? And isn't this a threat in other places if this holds? It could be. Uh, you know, the, the real threat, though, is just the nature of marijuana itself. It's, it's unlike anything else. I mean, liquor is something that we go to stores to buy, to party with, and have a good time. Medicine is something we go to pharmacies for that doctors keep very, and pharmacists keep very strict control over medicines that help us. Marijuana is somewhere in both of those camps. So it, it kind of makes it hard to maintain these dual regulatory schemes, dual supply systems, when you're talking about essentially in most cases a fungible product. I mean, yeah, there are salves and tinctures and oils and CBD things that are specifically for certain patients with certain conditions, but really the, the white fire OG that helps the cancer patient eat is the same white fire OG that gets me high. So it makes it difficult to try to maintain two separate systems. I think as we move toward the future, legislators are going to look at having combined systems, and especially in states that haven't yet passed medical marijuana, I think they may look at, let's just do the whole kit and caboodle at once. If I could wave a magic wand, there'd be one supply system, there'd be one set of regulations, one set of stores, but the patients would get tax breaks, they wouldn't have to pay stupid taxes, the stores would have, I like the medical recommendation idea, I think that's great to have stores with specific you know, medical uh, uh, certifications that can help patients out, but they should have much higher uh, possession limits. They should have the right to grow much more plants at home. They should not be subject to these crazy excise taxes. Uh, we'll just have to see how it all shakes out. So let's uh, look at uh, Oregon, uh, Senate yeah. Bill 844 and the Dash 6 oh, Amendments. Guess, sorry. When California legalized weed for so-called medical purposes. Sorry. That's, sorry. That's quite all right. Uh, We're look, a show within a show, and my automator kicked off on me. My apologies. <laughs> I've got the same thing going on here, brother. <laughs> so for the people who don't know, I didn't explain well on this end. Russ is live on his show out of Oregon. And uh, we're live on this show, so we connected our shows together to kind of consume this topic together, and I thank you for coming on to do that. Oh, it's my pleasure. We're kind of bi-coastal at the moment. I love it. Uh, coast to coast. <laughs> coast to coast. That's right. So All right, Oregon. Senate Bill uh, 844-6. Yeah, uh, what's happening in Oregon, there was a bill, 936, that was going to do to Oregon's medical kind of what Washington's done to its medical, and that is to vastly reduce the plant counts, uh, come up with regulations on where the, the grower should be, where the, the, the uh, dispensary should be, and so forth. And the people of Oregon, the, the patient community and the, and the marijuana community in general, 
rose up and fought that. Uh, I was there. I testified in Salem. Um, they were giving us only two minutes each to testify. Typical. And we took up, and we took up the entire two hours. So at <laughs> least 60 people testified. We had two overflow rooms filled, and the hearing room itself was filled while we were testifying. So they backed off that 936. They said, oh, it won't do that. But then they took 936 and resurrected it as a series of amendments they put into this other bill, 844, and they put it in last Friday, like 4.40 p.m. Political trickery. Had a chance to look at it, 89 pages worth of stuff, oh. trying to bury it, thinking we wouldn't notice. Well, we noticed, and they have been barraged. The Oregonian, our leading newspaper, has been talking about how the uh, legislators have been barraged with emails and calls about these 844-6 uh, amendments. No. What the amendments would do, um, the... Biggest thing that's in them is that it would limit current medical marijuana growers uh, who live in cities to only be able to grow 12 plants in the city. And if they lived outside of a city, they could grow 24 plants. Our law allows you to have six plants, six uh, mature plants, per patient that you're serving. So in essence, what this would do is reduce the city growers to two patients each and the country growers to four patients each. This was in reaction to some really huge grow sites that got some news, uh, one in particular that was for 104 patients, Ooh. and none of those patients were from Oregon. They were all from California. Oh, good Lord. That generated some negative headlines. The legislature wanted to attack that. But in doing so, they're really just putting the most vulnerable patients at risk. There's over 5,000 patients in Oregon who get their medicine from a grow site that serves more than two patients. So somewhere along the line, 5,000 patients are going to get told, we can't serve you anymore, and they're, are they expected to go to the dispensaries? Well, these 56% of the patients in the Oregon Medical Marijuana Program are on food stamps, Social Security, or disability. So they're not the kind of people who can afford to go to a dispensary, and especially when these are the people that they're not like me. I, you know, I can buy an ounce, and it's going to last me a while. Right. These are the kind of people that are using an ounce a week, an ounce every, you know, two ounces a week. They can't afford to spend $200 plus whatever the taxes end up being uh, to be able to take care of themselves. It's, it's just really sad. So that's one of the things that they're trying to do. Uh, there's some other things in the Dash 6s. Uh, let me see if I can look those up while we're talking. Yeah, that's, that's, that's quite all right, because uh, this is kind of what we have to do in referencing this information. Uh, yes, yes. Um, so that was the, the, the main problem. Oh, another problem with these Dash 6 amendments is they want to require the medical marijuana growers, even the personal growers, uh, to maintain records kind of uh, track all of their grow, you know, how much they harvested, who they distributed it to, and so forth. And they want them to keep those records for seven years. It's like the dang guy RS. <laughs> now, for comparison's sake, in the state of Oregon, a pharmacy dispensing oxycodone only needs to keep its records for three years. Well, that's quite a difference. Yeah, just a little bit. And you're really expecting some... You know, maybe Vietnam vet who has a green thumb, who grows a few plants to help a couple cancer patients, in, you know, he's growing it in his basement. We're really expecting that guy to keep file cabinets worth of records for seven years? Really? No. These people are just going to go back to the black market. They're going to go back to doing it under the radar like they used to. Well, if you hamper a medical patient too badly, if you make it more expensive, if you make it less accessible, and there's a guy next door that's got very much, you know, something that will help you, isn't it quicker to go to the guy next door? Oh, it's exactly what's going to happen. And with uh, the, the the levels that we the levels we've got uh, uh, in in grows here in the state, as far as you know, the the recreational folks, people like me, will be able to grow four plants in our house. Medical growers will still be able to grow six plants, so long as you know things stay the way they are. Isn't it like three and, flowering and three uh, three vegging, something like that? No, no, six, six mature, eighteen immature. Okay. And uh, according to our legal counsel, they tell us that a patient would also be able to grow the four plants they get for recreational. They'd actually have 10 plants they'd be able to grow in their own home. So, yeah, the idea that someone's going to put up with a whole bunch of record-keeping requirements and high taxes when the, the home growers are going to be growing like crazy, it doesn't make any sense. Russ, I just got a couple minutes left before our commercial break, and so uh, I wanted to throw in the devil's advocate point of view before we hit that break. 
Uh, playing devil's advocate, wouldn't these legislators say that our action, it, 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 despite the people's wishes, the, despite the people's will, the people's will isn't regulatory enough. And the federal government is pressuring state governments to regulate, tighten it down, make sure it's highly regulated. And then the feds will leave your states alone. Isn't that where they're acting from? Yeah, that's the, the argument they bring to us all the time is that we have to abide by the coal memo, which says we have to you know, make sure that marijuana is not getting diverted out of state. Uh, the thing is that the Cole Memo has always been in reference to states that are legalizing marijuana, not so much the medical side. And Oregon has been pretty safe as far as not being raided by the DEA or busted by the feds in any way. So they're, they're concocting a threat, I think, that isn't too viable a threat. I mean, it always exists that we could get raided, but it hasn't really happened in Oregon. So that, that to me seems like, like scaremongering in the, in the, purposes of trying to get people to want to uh, accept some of these terms. Russ, I, Bell, Russ Belleville from 420radio.com. Thank you for coming on the program. Our commercial break's about to hit, and I don't want it to hit your air. <laughs> no problem. 420radio.org. Dor- dot .org, I'm sorry. I did the dot .com yeah. thing. 420radio.org, the Russ Belleville Show. Thank you so much for explaining this to us, uh, because there's a lot of inquisition going on, and uh, we needed your help into straightening it out. Well, anything I can do, I'm always here for you. Thank you so much, sir. We'll talk to you very soon. All right, take it easy. Uh, so that's that's the deal. Stuff going on. Things are changing. Could it happen to you? We'll talk about that next. 844-420-TALK if you want to talk about it now. You're getting the full melt. It started with Weed 1. Some have called it a watershed moment. Then came Weed 2. It's absurd that we would have to do this to get medicine. Now Dr. Sanjay Gupta is at it again, and he's reaching higher than ever with Weed 3. I never thought I would be smoking weed in the hospital. The movement behind it. We demand this plant go through the process of the FDA. The radical research. I have to say I'm kind of stunned. Week 3, The Marijuana Revolution. Each week, Pot Pitch takes a look at different medical or legal pot business as they attempt to seek investment capital and partners in order to take their business to the next level. What do investors like? And which entrepreneurs are shown the door? Real venture capitalists, smart entrepreneurs, and exciting business models in a brand new industry. Cannabis. Pot Pitch. Find out what this new marijuana industry will look like and who its players will be. Real deals, real people, real decisions. Pot Pitch at potpitch.com and featured on the Full Melt Radio Show. Got something to hide? Canalock offers discreet and effective storage solutions that destroy odor, so nobody knows. Canalock is a patented, charcoal-activated bag that discreetly stores your marijuana. Canalock is made from the same material as military chemical warfare suits. Get yours at canalock.com. Visit canalock.com to learn more about no-smell technology. With this warmer weather, I get more active. Headaches and pains keep me from doing things I enjoy, like golfing and working outside my yard. Toledo Hemp Center's new location, 1415 Sylvania Avenue, has shown me there is an alternative to pharmaceutical drugs. I use CBD, cannabidiol, infused hemp lotions, oral sprays, and topical oils. Thank you, Toledo Hemp Center, for helping me restore and maintain my health with no side effects and no high. Find out more at ToledoHempCenter.com. Does your dog or cat suffer with joint disorders, arthritis, anxiety, cancer, chronic pain, or other ailments, hemp or cannabis-based medicinal products are now legal. Why should your pets go without the same options that we have available? Try Satibis, a daily hemp oil with CBD. Satibis is quality inspected and made in the USA. Easy to use drops are applied directly to your pet's food. For your pet's wellness, try Satibis drops. Ask for Satibis at your local pet store or learn more at PetPain.com. It's the Full Melt Radio Show. Radio Show. So you can find us here Monday through Friday uh, from 7 until 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Every day talking about medical marijuana, cannabis, hemp. Uh, the subject is not going to go away. So we just had a very interesting conversation with Senator Mike Fulmer uh, from uh, Pennsylvania. A very, very interesting conversation about what could be happening in the future there. Will there be dispensaries in Pennsylvania offering adequate uh, materials for people to use uh, to relieve their pain? 
Uh, they're suffering their debilitating medical condition. So I'd like to in- invite on the program now Ian James from Canna Advisors out in uh, Colorado. Uh, welcome to the program, Ian. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for having me on the show this evening. Uh, look, uh, this was a uh, you did probably not have the benefit of uh, listening to our previous conversation. But I-, I can tell you leading into it based on a High Times article that I saw posted this morning. I think they did it yesterday. They highly chastised this bill. And so uh, and, and then I read some more about it. and I thought, oh, wow, this is horrible. Uh, but after talking to Senator Fulmer about this, I am very optimistic that they're going to get this done in a form that may not make perfect sense. It never does. Legislation is not a perfect process. Uh, but um, I think it's going to happen. And I was talking to you off the air uh, some days ago about reading the tea leaves about who might be next. And you pointed directly to Pennsylvania. And I was thinking Ohio. Um, what do you have to say about all this? You know, I I think Pennsylvania looks good, and kudos to Senator Fulmer for his efforts and and, and his his passion. Um, yeah, the, the the bill may not be taking form quite the way we would like to see, but as you indicated earlier, um, you know, it's it's a good solid baby step. It opens the door, it establishes a footprint, and and kudos for that. Um, you know, politics is a, is a difficult difficult world. And um, there's there's often a lot of compromise. Pennsylvania is coming together a way, uh, in a way that looks very similar to New York, um, in that we're talking oils only, uh, topicals, tinctures, no smokable flour, no vaporizable flour. Um, you know, I, I understand the the logic and the intent behind that. Um, and, and overall, I support it. You know, whatever it's going to take to to get the industry established in a state, I think once the establishment comes. The tax revenues will come, and and additional attention will be paid to the program. Uh, Ian, you guys, as a company at Canada Advisors, uh, do consultation to uh, people across the country as these markets emerge. Can you tell us about yourself a little bit and and how you're involved in the industry? Absolutely. You know, Canada Advisors is a we're an established consulting firm, uh, founded in 2012, really by demand, not by. It wasn't a strategic uh, decision for us to get into consulting. Um, the founders of Canada Advisors uh, received dispensary permit number eleven in the state of Colorado. Uh, seven, excuse me, in the state of Colorado. Um, they were approached by a group in Connecticut to go for a license there. It was a very competitive market for cultivation licenses for the state. Took that on, and and that was really the start of Canada, Canada Advisors. And the, the backbone of our business is in license acquisition and in business plan development, financial modeling, business assessment services. Um, we also offer design services and things like that. But, you know, when we're talking about Pennsylvania and a new market coming online, um, depending on the dynamics of the program, it may be, you know, competitive to extremely incompetitive with extremely high stakes required to, to have a, a viable run for a license. And that's what we help people do. Um, these are government, uh, you know, responses, and there, there are many hundreds of pages, and we essentially quarterback that effort. Do people, in your experience, uh, tend to lead into this industry blindly from a business standpoint? Hey, I see an opportunity. Uh, just as an entrepreneur, as a business person, I'm going to dive into it. Uh, do they ever come to you uh, in tatters and say, oh, no, I didn't expect all of this. What can I do? Uh, it's a very interesting question, Steve. I'll tell you, we have all kinds of people come through our office, um, those who are you know, looking to make a quick dollar and saying, hey, if I put up a million or two, uh, how can I get my money out in a year? And, and you know, that's a pretty tough proposition. Um, on the other hand, we have people come through our, our office who are very passionate about the medis- medicinal value of marijuana, and they want to help people, and they want to get involved, and they, they want to be good stewards for society. Um, so it's a real interesting mix. It's an interesting time in, in, in our industry. You know, we're, we're still in that early adapter phase, but we're in the a further point in the, in the adapter phase where everybody's coming out of the woodwork. Everybody wants a piece of it. Um, those of us that have been in the industry for a while are, are you know, we actually have a responsibility to kind of vet people because we want to uh, we're responsible operators. Well, you want to make sure that you're not, uh, you know, diving into somebody who's like really a criminal element that's trying to mix into the and be legitimate. I'm sure we've got people from Pennsylvania listening intently to what's going on. If there are people in Pennsylvania listening right now that that might need some consultation, that might have already a business plan in mind, uh, that would like to move forward as soon as they can, given the passage of this law, uh, when it happens, if it happens, 
How could how can they get in touch with somebody like Canop Advisors? You know, uh, Google's a great resource. Um, we we spend a little effort on, on coming up top. So when you do a search, I think Canop Advisors will be right there at the top of the list. But I do encourage uh, prospects to get engaged early. Um, you know, we've had uh, numerous cases where people will engage us. You know, a month. Uh, three weeks before an application is due versus people that we've been engaged with for maybe three, four, five months to prepare for the application submission. And those that um, do their due diligence and tee things up clearly have a tighter application and a stronger uh, presentation. Did you see the... I I encourage people to, you know, get involved early. Did you see the article today? I saw it today uh, talking about if you want to be a grower in New York... Uh, mm-hmm. That the application is going to cost you a ten thousand dollar non refundable deposit and two hundred thousand dollars for that permit. That's correct. The stakes continue to rise, and you know you you look at New York with five licenses for a population of nine million people. It will be the most competitive application race to date, and I would um, anticipate that the parties that succeed in in winning those licenses have applications budgets uh, upwards of a million dollars uh, and, and that's, this is this is a new dynamic for our industry i'm sure uh, it, it, it clearly is uh just a couple minutes left in the program it seems that in in some states they've passed some in, including in right there in colorado uh that uh, there's some limitation about who can invest in business in this market space it really varies by state and you're correct that um certain states will put certain limitations on ownership percentages when you're in a competitive application, you know, clearly this, this is a tax revenue for the state. And if you've got your team stacked with people that have a good tax history in the state, that's going to look good on your application. Um, with that said, going for an application is becoming, you know, the, the barriers to entry continue to rise. It's becoming a, a more and more expensive proposition. Uh, you need to, uh, it's pretty common to need to raise money. Um, there is a lot of money from, from, out of state, regardless of what state you're targeting, that is looking to get into the industry. And and you really just need to look at the regulations in play for that specific market. What are the requirements? What kind of um, scoring preferences have they outlined? Uh, typically, the scores issued that are, are pretty much cut and dry, but then there's what they call bonus points. And will you get bonus points for having investors in state versus out of state? And, it sounds like, a, probably the yes. sounds like a whole formula there. Ian James from Canna Advisors, thank you for coming on the program and kind of giving us a background of the industry that follows transformation in the marketplace with medical marijuana and retail cannabis. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me on the show, Steve. It's been a pleasure. The Full Belt Show is a production of TFM Media.